Wow, what a weather out there. Couldn't you be really lucky that you can stay inside right now and watch our keynote time? So before we welcome our guest, I would like to introduce again Luisa, who's doing our graphic recording. And I had the idea that maybe doing graphic recording yourself might be a really cool thing to graphic re graphically record your lectures when you're uh, studying. Just the idea for the study start from my side. And now um, I like to play either or with our professors again. Here we go. So, uh, Monica, rain or sun? Sun. Okay. Uh, Daniel, mountains or ocean? Ocean. Tent or hotel? Hotel. Falafel or burrito, Daniel? Falafel. Tea or coffee? T. And computer or iPad? iPad. Newspaper or Facebook? Facebook. Theater or panel discussion? <laughs> panel discussion. <laughs> Monica, that one is for you. <laughs> Arts or politics? Arts. Daniel, who's our guest? It's Marina Weisband. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. So I'm happy to introduce, um, briefly introduce Marina Weisband. She is a psychologist by training and an expert in digital part participation and political education. Most or some of you probably have also seen her as the political, the former political um, director, politische Geschäftsführerin of the Pirate Party Germany. She also published a quite interesting book on liquid democracy, democracy with new ideas on contemporary democracy. And when I looked on her own webpage, I found two very interesting things, um, how she de described herself. The one was that, and I'm, I'm unsure whether this is still true, and let's see what she says to that, that she lives in the ICE between Münster and Berlin which is a quite interesting place to live. And the other thing is that um, she thinks in English, Russian and German and therefore is sometimes a bit confused. I think that's also what I sometimes experience when I'm um, traveling, that I'm a bit confused because I'm thinking in different languages. But let's see um, what she says to this. So, but the topic is not about um, thinking in... English, no Russian, bilingual and in thinking. German. <laughs> but the topic is, um, Monica? Yeah, it's about digital participation. So um, how can we encourage participation and what can be done to overcome learned helplessness? These are questions at the heart of Marina Weisband's work. And uh, in her work, she has focused on two uh, different sites. One of them is the school and the other one is the municipality. So in today's keynote, she will address 
and share her experiences fostering participation at the level of the municipality. And as you said, liquid democracy is one of the concepts that um, will be relevant there. So um, we will look at how can digital platforms enhance participation um, in the next 20 minutes. And what I find very interesting is that Marina Weisband looks at cities of very different scales. Because when we talk about cities, you know, people think of Beijing, they think of Tokyo and New York, but hold on, Münster, Göttingen and Lüneburg, they're cities too. So let's take a look at places, digital spaces where democracy flourishes. Welcome, Marina Weisband. Hi, everybody. Uh, so nice to see you, although I do not see most of you, which is very weird for me. It's a challenging time, and I just want to tell all of you who are listening, you're doing okay. We're all doing fine. And no, I'm not living in the ICE right now. I'm living in Münster right now, and I cannot move away from here since I am a risk patient. So I'm staying home and focusing on uh, delivering thoughts into the camera. Um, and if I sound confused, it's, it's mostly technical issues. Uh, so keep that in mind. Now, I don't know how all of you feel right now, but I feel as if we're at a point where we, as uh, global citizens, are discussing what is democracy even. Um, it's uh, between what happens in the USA and protests in Berlin, anti-corona anti protests, we seem to be fighting about what is truth. Do we need journalism? Um, why are those in power actually in power? And who has or hasn't a say? And I think the reason why we are discussing what is democracy today is because it has changed. Because my generation, all of us alive today, are more powerful than any generation before us. We are better informed, or at least potentially, we are better informed, we are better connected, and we could have more power to distribute our thoughts and voice our opinions. But this has the potential to go both ways, really. It could be the potential for better participation, for new, never thought of kinds of participation that I have written about in a 2013 book that featured models like liquid democracy, talk about that a bit later, but it could go the other way. It could go to a state of more surveillance and more control. And how it goes, that is on us now. That really depends on what we do. So if you want to know which way democracy is going, I suggest you look to the cities. Why? So first of all, digital transformation eliminated physical distance as a main factor of communication. Yes, we had newspapers, we had books, but it was a totally different level. Uh, now, I feel like it doesn't um, affect us so much whether we live in the same nation as the conditions we live under. So a city like Lüneburg might have more in common with Cambridge than with Hamburg. And Hamburg, on the other hand, might have more in common with Odessa. So it just makes sense that these cities connect worldwide in their communication, in their collaboration, um, while the nation states lose their potential and lose their importance. Um, also, the significance of cities and villages as democratic, deliberately spaces grows. Cities are the main space where democracy grows because a democracy is based on the ability to be responsible for one another, which is so much more easy when you actually see each other and have interests in common. And as I said, some cities worldwide have more interests in common with similar cities than with other entities like villages or uh, like big metropolis. Also, it's where we can learn democracy. And I want to elaborate on that. So my job, my day job, is implementing student participation in schools. I do that via the project Aula that um, allows for digitally enhanced 
uh, participation of all students uh, in their school um, everyday activities and um, sometimes in their lessons or in their rules. So what I did when I began this project is I did focus groups and I asked students like, uh, what is your utopian school? What would you change if you could change anything? And you had all the money in the world and all the power in the world. What would you change to make your school a place that you love to go to? And the answers I received were a bit shocking. They were like, I don't know, I guess better toilets. Or um, they said, oh, why, why would I participate? The teachers are going to end up doing what they want anyway. And this reminded me of a phrase. It reminded me on they up there do what they want and they don't listen to us, the little people. And it's the baseline for every uh, populist movement ever. Um, but it's more than that. It's what I call, an, um, it's, it's a psychological concept of learned helplessness. It's the um, concept when you grow up without the possibility to change something and then when you get the possibility to change it you have neither the competences needed nor the desire to change anything so you stand back and the only way to heal that is experience of self-efficacy and self-efficacy is really the main concept that I focus on in my work it's how can we allow people to learn that when they do something, when they fight for something, voice their opinion, find majorities, they can change a thing in the world. And this is really the most important part because it's the one thing that allows us to really be responsible. And I have found in my work two places where we can learn self-efficacy. One is the school and one is the municipality. Uh, both have some things in common. Uh, this is where we reach all people independent of their wealth, income, um, of the, the color of their skin and so forth. Um, everyone who is in this space can participate. Um, it's not a, like a, a, a university where you have only a certain education level and so on. Second, people see each other physically and they develop a political energy. I don't know if you've ever been to a demonstration, but if you have, you know what I'm talking about. When people are physically together in a room, they develop a certain kind of energy that is needed for democracy. And that is why democracy can never be exclusively virtual. We need to have spaces where we gather and see each other because this is how we learn that other people exist because our brains are a bit dumb like that. And um, the third point is when people change something here, they see it every day. So we can uh, say, I want a park and I organize and I um, do flyers and we finance a park and we rebuild the old city park. And when we walk through it, it's like walking through a monument of our collaborative effort. And each day, this reminds us of the power we have in the world. So um, making, allowing for more participation in cities is really important. And several efforts have been made towards this. And some examples that I have personally worked with is um, the Burger household in Münster. So this is where the citizens had a certain amount of money that they could allocate via ideas that they um, gathered in an online forum. And um, Liquid Friesland, where um, something similar happened, so people could gather ideas and put ideas forth how they could improve uh, Friesland. And it was um, gathered online and they could vote on these ideas. And um, it was a liquid democracy platform. Liquid democracy is this mixture form between direct democracy and representative democracy, where everyone gets a vote but I don't need to vote on every topic because I don't necessarily am interested in every topic or I don't have the expertise so I can delegate my vote to someone who is more experienced than me. And um, both experiments were not successful and they were unsuccessful because people were not participating. So government officials said, okay, we allowed people to participate, but they just aren't. So what's the point even? They don't want more democracy. They just want to be led. 
because people are lazy. And that is not true, because when you analyze why people were not participating, the answer everywhere is quite obvious, because these systems were not binding. Me voting on something did not have any real effect, except for uh, officials to have an idea what is popular, but that's basically a poll, it's not participation. And if uh, something where I participate is not binding, why would I bother to do my research, to activate people around me, to invest real work? If in the end of the day, I learned that municipalities can just say, oh, that's a nice idea, thank you, I'll write it down on my invisible typewriter. So. Um, one positive example that I've come across is in my home city of Kiev in Ukraine, um, one uh, area, Abalone, is working with liquid democracy, but there the municipality uses it. And um, this is going well because it is binding, because we have a contract. What I do when I go to uh, my schools, I work um, in all of Germany with about 12 schools, with Aula, is I make a contract between the students and the school board that defines what students can and cannot change. And the school board basically agrees to carry all the ideas, to agree to all the ideas that the students vote on. Um, and they have a list of the things that they cannot change, like they cannot make personal decisions on the teachers and a list what they can change, like um, they can change the rules. Um, so this brings me to my second point. Even if people can participate in a binding way, which is a very good first step, they also need to learn to do it because it isn't enough to want democracy. You also have to be able to do it. And uh, democracy actually requires a long list of, um, of competences like gather and filter relevant information, understand your own needs and desires, be able to voice them, be creative, be able to compromise, pay attention to minority protection, make plans and execute those plans, be tolerant and so on. Where do we learn all of that? Uh, for Germany, I can say there is hardly a space where everyone is and where you learn these things. So that is why I personally work in schools, because um, if we not only allow students to participate, but if we actually um, discuss the process in the lessons, during the lessons, if we reflect on this process, if we learn in the artistic subjects, what am I even? Who am I? Uh, what is my society like? And how would I like it to be? Um, learn to think creatively beyond toilets. And if uh, we discuss in uh, like German, how do I make an argument for my point? How do I discuss? Uh, that is what we need. But unfortunately, democracy also involves a lot of adults. And it's a bit too late for them to, work, to learn these things in school. So we really need to think about how can we, um, as adults, learn together how to be responsible for each other, how to understand our own needs and how to act on them. Um, and we need to do that in the municipality as well. We need more spaces for this. We need more uh, third spaces, which is neither our homes nor our workspace. Um, but parks, uh, libraries, community colleges. I'm a fan of integrating community colleges, making them more prominent and integrating them with public spaces like libraries, cafes and bars. Huge fan of community bars where you can drink and learn and discuss and talk to people of other political opinions than yourself. Um, furthermore, what we could expand is um, randomly chosen citizen councils on certain topics. This is especially important when you change something that has to do with identity, because identity tends to pull people apart and each question of identity, like how do we name streets? Should we name streets for racists? What even is a racist? And also what do we do about Corona? So we know this is what the science says, but how can it be implemented in our community, in our city? What kind of rules do we want to enact? If you say this um, as, as the mayor, it has one effect. If 
a council of your peers decides on these rules. It has an entirely different effect, even if the outcome is the same. Uh, we need to have more citizen councils on these kinds of questions because I think it would take a lot of drama out of politics. Ah, oh, that's a weird thing to say. Long story short, we need nothing short of a second wave of enlightenment in this age of digital transformation. And urban spaces are where it's going to happen. And every one of us, no matter our uh, profession, be it uh, doctors or um, attorneys, we are all educators now. And we all need to educate people a bit more in our field because people need to know more to navigate a more complex world. And um, the best space to navigate it together is the space where we meet each other every day and where we have to live together in physical proximity. And these are the cities. So that's my point for more democracy in cities. And I look very much forward to your questions. Thank you very much for this very interesting keynote. And as we're waiting for student questions, maybe I can start with the first question. Um, Marina, I was wondering, since um, you talked about digital participation, what about questions of access? Because not everybody has access to these technologies. Um, I think it's a problem that is going to go away soon, like magic, it will disappear. No, um, actually, uh, we know now that about 17% of all Germans are not connected to a proper internet connection. And we know that many, especially in the elderly population, uh, do not have the competence to navigate um, the devices themselves. But... You know, I learned that um, the the first part, well, we have to do better. We just have to do better. It's it's really an infrastructure problem, and it's a problem of why our minister is still our minister, uh, doing nothing about this problem, but it is going to go away. The second problem is more interesting because we have some people who uh, aren't able to navigate devices, and I think that the more sense it makes for them to use devices, the easier it is to learn. Uh, my grandma learned to use Twitter and uh, she uh, bought a computer specifically for that, uh, just to follow me because I never called. And she doesn't even speak German. She uh, Google translates everything and she was not a digital native. Um, it's just when you have the motivation, it's much easier to learn. Also, devices are uh, easier and easier to navigate for, especially the elderly people. Um, and the third problem is that not everyone can afford the devices. And this is something that really mustn't be a problem because it's so much more important to have some kind of connection to the Internet than, say, to have a TV or to have a radio. Uh, today. And we finance TV and radio in Germany um, from e even the poorest get access to TV and radio. So I think it must be equivalent with kind of modern uh, internet access devices. Okay. Uh, when we talk about uh, Marina, when, when I think that's a, that's a in very interesting vision. How you know that that everybody has access and th that you, the, the story about your grandmother. But don't we also give kind of the you know you you even mentioned um, Google Translate. Yes. Don't we give power to, or don't we run into risk to give power to big companies? controlling our data and kind of run into the risk of doing exactly the opposite that we want to achieve, more democracy, more inclusion, as we kind of give our data to, to, to companies that, that want to control and use this maybe for, for having a certain power? Very good question. Perfect question. Because um, the way I see it is we have a bit of a tug of war between two sides in the mm -hmm. 21st century regarding how our main infrastructure, the internet, needs to look. Mm -hmm. And on one side, we have big companies and authoritarian governments, which both are interested in our most centralized internet with um, 
few knots of access where all the data come through. Um, obviously, the big companies want to have monopolies and connected data is always more valuable than mm -hmm. distributed data. And uh, authoritarian states want to have control over the information flow and to be able to censor things. On the other hand, we have uh, global citizens mm -hmm. who have the most interest in a decentralized internet where um, everyone gets to keep their own data on their own machines and it's only pulled when needed mm -hmm. and where we have um, a lot of open access and um, interoperability between platforms. And I do not see a lot of political effort on the side of global citizens. Mm -hmm. And when I say I want liquid democracy systems, I want uh, school systems that, are, um, that support participation, I'm talking about open source, okay. open access okay. uh, systems. And we absolutely need to invest more in that. Um, I personally uh, developed the Ola system, which is open source. And it's very hard to do in Germany because you hardly get public funding for open software. And um, we need to be more politically active in achieving distributed and decentralized um, systems. And we need to talk about who they belong to and who the physical infrastructure mm -hmm. belongs to. <laughs> No questions from the students so far. Maybe we should invite them again. So please share your questions if you have some. Please, I'm so and interested in if yes. anyone was watching. <laughs> I mean, we can keep talking for quite a while, but it would be great maybe to have some, some questions from you, the students here. Um, yeah, um, until we have questions, I ask another one. I'm. Um, I'm very intrigued by this idea of liquid democracy, but I also heard a couple of, well, negative things about concepts of a direct democracy recently, that especially in the context of the far right, this is also something that can be taken advantage of. And I was wondering, is that also something, uh, also a disadvantage of liquid democracy or does liquid democracy differ from something like Volksabstimmung, for example? Um, these are actually two questions because liquid democracy does differ a bit um, in that it solves one essential problem. Um, I do not have the expertise to talk about every topic. And I also do not have the time to invest research in every topic that I might vote on in a direct democracy. So I'm glad that I have the opportunity to delegate my vote to someone else. But um, as it is with direct democracy, um, I'm not a fan of direct democracy in the sense that uh, government asks a question and we can all vote on the question and the best argument against this was Brexit. I do not consider Brexit a particularly good example of democracy at all mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. democracy for me begins at deliberation and deliberation is really the process that needs to happen in public. Um, so the forming of the question itself is already deeply biased and we need to enable the public to discuss the question before it gets to answer it. Um, of course, you could be afraid that fascists might use direct democracy or the extreme right. Um, but honestly, the extreme right and fascists profit from uneducated people, from less democratic systems. And the worse off a country is, the more the far right benefits. So when we have a, a possibility for people to voice their opinions and their concerns, the far right dramatically loses because it's ultimately a populist party that lives off this learned helplessness. Mm -hmm. As soon as we don't have that, we considerably have a lower risk of fascist movements. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I, I want to follow up on this, on this idea of liquid, of liquid democracy. And, and kind of, I think that's a strong vision. And do you think that our current institutions in our democratic system, and we, we all have, you know, besides all of the shortcomings, I think we, we have the great luxury that we live in a de democratic um, society. Do we need new institutions? Do we need new parties? I think that's, that's particularly interesting uh, talking to you. you know, I think the, 
die Piratenpartei ist kind of at least as I have seen it is, is kind of, was a was a or is a, an idea of, of changing the idea of parties. Now you're kind of member of a different party, which is a more classical party. Does this idea work in the current um, democratic institutions that we have, or do we also need to rethink our democracy as it with the institutions that we have at the moment? I've been thinking about this a lot, and in 2012, I was on the verge of proposing replacing the parliament by a liquid democracy system. Mm -hmm. But since I learned that this would not be a good idea at all, because uh, in liquid democracy, the wonderful thing, the liquid thing about it is that every day I wake up and I decide how much of a citizen versus politician I am today on a continuum. Mm -hmm. That is the liquid part, my, my role in the system. So every day changes who has power. But when you don't know really who has power tomorrow, you cannot control that power well. What we have in Germany, this division of power, the division of the legislative versus the executive branch, you cannot really have that in liquid democracy. Mm -hmm. Because in Germany, we have very different rule, sets of rules for politicians and for usual citizens. Um, so liquid democracy is, I think, a very good addition to the democratic system mm -hmm. that we have. And it's far, far, far better than the polls mm -hmm. that politics orient themselves um, mm -hmm. around now. So right now, I, we know that our chancellor is governing very much by polls, but in polls, a thousand people with landline are called, mm -hmm. and my generation doesn't have a landline at all. So um, liquid democracy system would be superior, but I would not replace parliament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to follow up on your um, idea of the third spaces that are needed also, because you said that people also have to meet physically. And from my observation, these public spaces um, and uh, community centers, for example, they're often endangered because of commercial interests, of new housing projects. So where interests are pitted against each other, often uh, and often these public spaces are the ones that are forced to close down or move to the outskirts of the city where they're not really accessible for people anymore. And I was wondering if you could comment on that, whether that's an observation that you would share and uh, whether, yeah, w is there a vision, do you have a vision for what third spaces might actually should look like for, um, well, proper participation, ideally? So look, um, there are certain areas um, like healthcare, education and democracy that just do not belong on the free market. Um, they are the foundation of our life in coordination with most human rights. So we need to take them off the market. When we have a library, when we have a community college, they shouldn't compete with uh, big department stores. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I realize, a leftish political idea, um, but I think that we, may, we need to make sure by law that each city has the capacities for these third spaces in order to people to be able to exist somewhere uh, for free. Uh, right now, the space where we can exist for free are dying out. I need to pay to be anywhere right now. I need to pay rent. I need to, to pay to be at a restaurant. I'm escorted out if I don't. I need to pay to be in shops. I need to pay everywhere I go. And if I do not have that kind of money, I'm a second class person who has no space left in the city. And um, many cities pride themselves on having low homelessness rates, um, but not because you know, they fight homelessness, but because they just don't allow the people to exist in the city. Um, and I think if we want to uh, be stronger as a democracy, we need to have spaces where we can talk to people who have uh, not necessarily the same means and interests as we have to be in these certain spaces. Um, it's just a decision we need to make. Do we want to exist somewhere for free like we allows our car like we allow our cars to be mm -hmm. so 
I think we have a, a student question. Um, it's Paula. Hello. Hi, um, good to see you. So my question is, we say um, everyone needs to have access to digital participation, and so people need um, devices. So my question is, because from what I know, most of these devices are not produced sustainably, and um, we have a lot of problems with that, like hearing about mines, for example, in Africa. So my question is, how can we make sure that our digital progress is not going um, on the cost of others? Uh, thank you so much, Paula. Um, so my first proposal would be a right to repair. Um, because right now, yes, we have a lot of devices, but we wouldn't need much many more devices to be able to give everyone one. We would just have not to change them every two years necessarily while they're perfectly functioning and just don't receive updates. So it's really two problems. When I have a smartphone, first of all, I cannot um, repair it myself and I uh, am not allowed to. And the second problem is that it's super dependent on the software that's running on it. Um, so I need two things. First of all, I need open hardware that is allowed to be repaired in every repair shop. Uh, so it can live longer. And the second thing is I need open access to this hardware. I need um, the ability to install a new operating system on this one. And this, again, is a question of law. It's a political question because we allow big companies to basically produce garbage um, that needs to be replaced every two years. And this is a much bigger waste um, than giving everyone access to the internet. If there is at the moment no, no further student question, I have a, um, another question. Um, you, are, you, you have been arguing for, the, for a second or, or you are proposing a second wave on, of enlightenment, which is, this is huge. Yes. Um, and, and, but you also mentioned kind of um, the current situation in the US, for instance, in other countries where we, where we see developments that might go in a fundamentally different direction. Where do you think we stand at the moment? Are we, you know, is, is it, are, we, are we kind of on this way of a second wave of enlightenment? If we look globally, or do you think, um, well, this is a great idea, this should be, but all the signs that we see around the globe are, are going into a different direction. So who is we? Uh, we as Germany or we the as global? <laughs> maybe on two levels. Let's start okay. in Germany and Europe and then maybe look on, the, look on the globe. Okay, so Germany and Europe are like Switzerland in the Second World War. We're really undecided between fascism and not fascism mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. we basically uh, are very confused what's going on and we're looking on and we are just outraged that we need to have discussions about race and politics. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have not understood as a society in, in Germany, I'm talking about German mainstream mm -hmm. society here, but also many centrists worldwide mm -hmm. uh, who do not understand that this right now, this is a fight mm -hmm. and you cannot not pick a side in this because um, we see, first of all, a new technology that might enable us to have this second wave of enlightenment. We had the first wave after the invention of the book print, which allowed for one to many communication. So suddenly one person could talk directly to many, many people. And uh, this allowed for absolutely new understanding wh what education is good for, who should get an education, mm -hmm. who should read, uh, how everyday people should use their minds and their intellect. Now, we have with uh, the internet, many to many communication mm -hmm. for the first time. And this is an absolutely huge breakthrough. And um, according to Marx, every technological breakthrough leads to a cultural breakthrough. Mm -hmm. So uh, our ability to communicate to everyone to suddenly go viral should go hand in hand with a new responsibility for mm -hmm. that kind of power. Mm -hmm. And this is where the enlightenment comes in. And this is where we need to learn to handle power, each one of us. Mm -hmm. But of course, 
um, the conservatives, the alt-right, the fascists also see that. And usually more extreme movements are the first one to catch on to new technology. Yeah. As it happened here, the alt-right immediately understood the potential of social media and its interaction with classical media, which uh, the center absolutely did not. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have now a very globalized alt-right movement, uh, which is very well connected, which is very well using um, its means to amplify their voice. And um, everyone who is anti-fascism don't do that, mm -hmm. uh, which is a huge problem. So I think when we talk about cities and participation in cities, this should be a moment of activation. Mm -hmm. This should be a moment of minorities telling us, hey, hi, a problem is going on and my life is not safe at the moment. And if you want to protect me, please uh, do counter speech online. Uh, please do not invite racists mm -hmm. to talk shows. Uh, please do not amplify uh, racist voices. We need to learn how to handle responsibility or we might just end up in a fascist state that is able to surveil our every step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really important. I, I actually agree with that. I find it really scary to see that um, the way that people uh, talk about anti-fascism in a very, you know, discrediting way recently. So that's really, really worrying and kind of shows the, the the path that might be ahead of us. But we have another student question. Um, I think it's Friederike. Uh, yes, uh, hi. Um, so uh, I find this um, idea of liquid democracy very interesting that uh, people are able to um, engage more in the political system and actually have more uh, a voice. Um, but uh, how can we combine that with the urgency of uh, living sustainable, sustainable, because I have the feeling that many people, they feel like they uh, have to restrict themselves uh, or like we have to like lower our standard of living, but uh, many people don't really want to do that. Um, so um, if these people, uh, like if all of the people uh, are able to take actively part in the de decisions, but don't want to live more sustainable, then how can we meet the actions we need to do in order to fight the climate crisis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you, Frederica. I think it's the only way we can do it. Because um, I cannot imagine someone from up above saying, oh, you all need to lower your standard of living and people actually listening. So I think this idea that is being pushed from the right, like a, a economic dictatorship, wouldn't work at all. Um, people just wouldn't listen and they would revolt. The only way for us all to decide, okay, we need to change the way we do economy is to decide it together. Because the... The heavier a decision is, the more it needs to be a democratic decision. And I think that it really helps to have control over it. Because ultimately, people do not need so much to fly to Spain for holidays. What people really need is to feel in control of their lives. And what people need is to feel important and um, like, like they know what is going on. So when someone says, you cannot fly to Spain, they are like, what? But this is part of my identity. If it suddenly becomes part of their identity, not to be consumers, but to be creators of their surroundings, mm -hmm. if we change their role like that, it isn't so important to them what or how much they consume. They can more easily pride themselves of being responsible and they can more easily look for ways to live their fullest life with all the fun but while not, you know, burning down earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Friederike. Marina, there's a line from your presentation that still that stuck with me. And uh, you said that the nation states are losing importance as well, the city is gaining importance as the nation states are losing importance. Yes. But um, you talked about the author authoritarian regimes, about the far right. So my question is, nation states are losing importance for who? Because there are contexts in which we seem to have a 
sudden resurgence of the importance of the nation state also. Yeah, it's a very interesting phenomenon, isn't it? I think it's like a dying animal rising for the last time because they feel they are losing importance and they try to make the nation state a thing. But if we look at the alt-right movement, I think they are the best example for how nation states are dying. Because right now, look at, um, I don't know, a movement, a cult, a political cult like QAnon, which is an anti-Semitic right-wing extreme cult that uh, basically worships Donald Trump, but they are uh, supported financially and in amplification of their voices by the Russian government. And they are spreading to Germany and taking over German movements and also French movements like uh, the Yellow Vests. So um, we are looking at a very, very international alt-right that is actually far better connected than the left has ever been. I've been to the demonstrations um, in Kiev on the Maidan in 2013 and 14. And what I saw there was a massive, uh, so on the Maidan, there have been all kinds of movements that were against the Ukrainian government. Uh, and it was all of them. It was the anarchists, it was uh, the Jews, it was the Muslims, it was the Christians, it was communists, Nazis, everybody was there. Um, so a lot of infighting happened, and we saw that uh, the anarchists and the communists were expelled from these demonstrations by the Nazis, but not only by the Ukrainian Nazis. The Nazis have gathered massive support from Finland, Sweden, Germany, Poland. Um, they are internationally very well organized. So I'm thinking if they take their strength from international collaboration, are they really making a good point for nationalism? <laughs> Interesting point. Um, so, so we have a, yeah, something to think about. We, we have another, another student question. It's Lawrence. Hi, Lawrence. Hi. Um, I would be interested in um, the idea of liquid democracy. And there's a question that I, kind of arises to me. Um, as far as I understand it, the idea is to kind of split up the vote into segments or topics and then make sure that, for instance, am I very, very, like, very well informed in a certain kind of topic, I could vote myself there or even try to convince other people that they give me their part of that vote and then I can give my vote to people in topics where I have no clue of. Exactly. Well. Mm -hmm. In a certain way, it becomes interesting to me, how do you split up the vote? Like, how do you make sure that the topics don't overlap? For instance, like, um, we have a minister of finance, we have a minister of um, um, whatever, Umwelt. Uh, how do you make sure that, like, I don't vote for something in one place, maybe not even I did it, but I just gave my vote to somebody, and then I vote for a completely different direction on the other place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a brilliant question because um, it's actually, it describes the situation we're in right now. Um, so the problem is problems are growing more complex. And while they're growing more complex, they touch on many more um, areas. Uh, I can give you the concrete example how we did it in the Pirate Party. In the Pirate Party, you had three steps of delegation, if you will. You had the global delegation, which is, I'm not participating at all. Um, this guy is my representative, which would be the equivalent of voting for your representative. In all the questions, this is my guy. And they would vote for you, except if you vote for a certain topic or a certain um, question yourself, it always overrides your global delegation. Then there were uh, topics that you can basically split by ministries if you want, and I can delegate my vote to different people, which will normally represent my political ideas, my viewing of uh, humans, and um, they will usually vote along the lines of like a party would vote if I choose them well. 
Um, and then there was the lowest rank, which was the individual questions. And I could also delegate my vote for a certain individual question to someone, uh, or I could delegate, uh, or, or I could vote myself for a specific question. Now, if this specific question touches on several areas, this is where I need to check. And the voting itself was not a single moment in time. It was about two weeks. So I always have the opportunity to look, how do my delegates vote for me? And am I d'accord? And if I'm not, I can easily place my vote somewhere else to be in accordance with my other ideas. But um, for the ideas not to overlap, not to go contrary, like I say, we need more cars and also more clean energy and environmental mm -hmm. protection. I could do that, right? Um, this is not a question about who I delegate my vote to. This is a question of how do I form formulate the question itself. And this is a result of deliberation because um, we need as a society to understand the consequences of our decisions. And if I say I want more cars, I need to understand what the downside is. And we cannot really handle this problem in our actual political system now because we have the different resource and the different resource are run by different parties who do not necessarily go in the same direction on the issues. So this is a problem that would actually be improved the more we discuss together. And this is something that needs to happen online but on liquid democracy platforms and offline in these third spaces in cities. Is that an answer to your question? Uh, yeah, actually that, that would lead me to uh... A second question that I have. Um, I'm just going to ask the question, like standing for itself, stand alone. Um, at what point would you say that um, a digital service or a platform, um, due to a public that is rising up in that platform on that service, has to be considered an infrastructure rather than a service? Because um, I feel like um, we are, it's hard if you have a group or a movement or something and to raise the literacy for the media needed in order to get something running fast enough before, like people just want to move on, right? And, and uh, the, the just basic idea of one person, one vote, here's a super simple voting platform, uh, let's go, is just a lot faster and on the other hand we are using a lot of platforms and services where a public like arised there is a like on twitter that is public uh, on facebook yes. that is public all these places are public but not they're not in control of the public so at what like how do you how do you shift that do you have any idea of how to shift that so my first answer would be interoperability. Um, for those not familiar with the term, it means that different platforms need to be able to communicate between themselves. The protocols need to be open. So when I post something on Twitter, it needs to be able to be read from Facebook or from the super obscure platform that I programmed myself. Um, this is the way to break monopolies of social networks that always tend to build monopolies because I want to be where all my friends are at. Um, the second thing is, I agree with you that uh, like a platform that would offer liquid democracy or even a platform that is used by the wide public to discuss political issues as are Facebook and Twitter right now, are not services, they are infrastructure. And infrastructure, um, I circle back, I, don't, I do not think it belongs on the open market. So I'm not uh, for, uh, I don't know, uh, taking control of Facebook. Um, Facebook can be, I just do not think that we should make our public debate over democracy, our very most important uh, infrastructure in the hands of a uh, privately run for-profit organization because Facebook is not evil in amplifying misinformation and um, mostly radical ideas. It's just what it needs to do to generate money and 
generate money is what it promised to do. It's its goal. Its goal was never to be a good platform for democracy. Mm. So we need to uh, provide independent platforms, uh, open source platforms uh, that belong to their users, not even to the state, but to their users collectively. And this is something that the government is not tackling um, as much as I wish it would. Would you like the government to tackle the issue? Because I feel like maybe it's just not the actor. The government's, uh, yeah, well, the government should fund it mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. our money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. And I think we are already at the end, unfortunately, Marina. That was uh, fantastic talking to you. Um, and I think this was a great inspiration also for our students. Thank you so much on this perspective on the future of cities. And um, have a great time. And hopefully, we will soon have again the chance to meet also in third spaces. Um, <laughs> In the ICE, maybe, between <laughs> Münster and Lüneburg. That would be fantastic. In, in the community bar. See you there. Great. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Have a good time, Bye. Marina. So, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Marina. Wow, uh, that was really interesting for me as well because the call for a new enlightenment uh, combined with these concrete ideas of open, open access and um, that something should not be in, in the hand of the open market, um, I think is a really good combination of what you're doing right now as well. Having a vision, a big idea, and then make it very concrete. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Monica. And I have to say, um, see you tomorrow at 12.15 uh, for the final show yes. where there's going to be, yay, you two as well, where there's going to be um, four videos, videos of yours and um, two of your critical comments right on that screen where we just had that uh, great speaker and a whole uh, other stuff. Uh, we're going to play the podium again and have all the, the studio and I say, um, have a good day and see you tomorrow.
Thank you.